afternoon. I am Deb Bergevin. I am um, the ORP Education Subcommittee Co-Chair. And on behalf of myself and my partner in crime, Joyce Toll, we want to welcome you to Open Forum. Um, my day job, I am the Quality Assurance and Regulatory Affairs Manager for the Community and Network Site Affiliate Program at Fred Hutch Cancer Center. And uh, that's here in Seattle. And so I also want to welcome you to Seattle, our beautiful city. Days like this is why we live here. Um, let me move on quickly to the agenda. I just want to go through this really quick. Um, going to have just a few announcements. And then we're going to um, review the new CRA workbench interface. Then we'll have a refresher um, course on the specimen tra tracking system. And then um, uh, we're going to get back to basics and test our knowledge on the um, on some interactive Q and A. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some uh, any questions. Let me get to the announcements here. Just a few logistic details. Uh, please keep your phone and computers, as we just learned, on mute, and that will help with the sound quality. And any questions that those have, uh, if you are attending virtually, please use the chat box. And thank you, Tasha, for manning our chat um, chat um, boxes like that. Our questions there. Um, any of the pres all of the presentations are going to be posted on the SWAG website after, um, after the meeting. And although there are no formal CE credits for this meeting, you can use a, you can print a copy of the agenda to reflect your attendance if you're collecting those for any SOCRA or ACRP um, attendance reports. This slide, if anyone, you guys might be familiar with this if you attended OISHI. Earlier today, we had a practice run using the Pull Everywhere. Um, Christine will walk us through this when it's time. These instructions will come up again. It's super easy. When it's time, you'll just uh, use your mobile and um, go in to be able to do this. All right. I think to start us off, uh, we have, uh, I'm happy to introduce Angela Smith from the SWAG Statistics and Data Management Center here to show us the redesign of the CRA workbench. Angela. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to see people in person. Welcome to Seattle. So um, some of you who are newer might be thinking to yourself, CRA Workbench, what's that? Or some of you might be thinking to yourself, CRA Workbench, that old thing. And so one of the first things that I want to talk about is um, emphasizing the purpose of the CRA Workbench and its continued relevance. Um, the CRA Workbench first came about in 2003, so almost 20 years ago, which is a little hard for me to believe, um, but it, it did serve as SWOG's EDC system prior to starting to use RAVE. And so the CRA Workbench first um, continued relevance has to do with any studies that uh, were activated prior to RAVE and to continue to collect data. Uh, many of those studies still use the CRA Workbench for that pre-RAVE data submission. Also, the workbench has uh, a variety of reports on it, um, in particular expectation, query, other reports. And what's important about those is that those are designed and maintained by staff at the SDMC, and they will include data for both your RAVE studies and your pre-RAVE studies, whereas the DQP and the other things that are connected only to RAVE will only include data for those studies. So if you want to see data for um, all of your studies, those reports are a good resource. The SWOG ORP or CRA manual is um, maintained by staff at the SDMC and includes a lot of really helpful information, uh, particular to SWOG trials. There's links to that from the CRA workbench. And then as you'll see me go through some slides, there's a number of tools and calculators and resources, many of which that have been have been um, the ideas of CRAs in the field that they want to see things like this um, online and that we have built and continue to maintain for your use. And then finally, um, we have links to all of the external things uh, that are popular like Open, Rave, SpecTrack, and other key pages on swag.org that you can get to from the CRA workbench. 
Um, so we are in the process of redesigning the workbench and we're moving right along. It's in testing right now. And so I would imagine that it would be released within the next month or so. Um, the way to access the new look of the CRA work workbench is exactly the same as it's accessed now. So nothing is changing, changing about how it's accessed. It's just, we're changing what it looks like. So to get to the CRA workbench, you would go to the clinical trials tab on swag.org. Underneath that, there is a link to the CRA workbench. It will require a CTEP IAM logon, same to it. it same to the way you log on now, and none of that is any different than the way you access the workbench now. The current CRA workbench looks something like this. Again, this is a design from 2003. Got a lot of text in the middle, some links on the left-hand side, a very nice blue and orange motif that uh, matched the swag.org website at the time, does not anymore. And the new design looks like this. So you can tell that we have um, updated this quite a bit to match the swag.org website. Um, but the left hand, the left hand navigation main, uh, stays the same, um, except that we've reorganized the content a little bit, hopefully to make it easier to find what you need. And uh, that's gonna be the bulk of my presentation today is kind of introducing you to where we've moved everything. And before I get into that, I do wanna thank the feedback of many CRAs that gave us input on um, what this should look like and how it would be helpful. So thank you very much for all that feedback that we got from you. So I'm gonna start with the first option in the left-hand navigation bar, that's our popular resources. This will be expanded by default and this has all of the things that we are told that you do most often. So open, rave, spec track, audits and monitoring page, the SWOG best pra practices and new CRA training. Secondly, we have a tools menu. This includes a BSA calculator, your creatinine clearance calculator. And I was reminded last night um, by Sue Fun that I need to add the ideal body weight calculator to this because we recently added that to the tools of the trade page on, um, on, the, on the current CRA workbench. And I need to add it to this as well. Um, I'm gonna back up just a minute and mention that the, in the current CRA workbench, the tools of the trade page includes both a bunch of calculators and tools like this, and also a bunch of resources. And in this new design, we have separated out what we consider to be tools versus what we consider to be resources to hopefully make those lists a little bit shorter and easier to find what you need. So we also under tools, we have a date counter um, tool, um, the clinical trial review guide for those of you who help us review our clinical trials and the COVID protocol deviation logs. And then again, under resources separately, we have a bunch of information specific to SWOG, uh, best practices again, uh, the CRA newsletters, uh, the SWOG glossary, because you can never have too many reminders of what all these acronyms mean. Um, a link to the IRB regulatory procedures on swag.org and a link to the, the policies page on swag.org. Then we have some CTEP um, and open related links. And finally, your standard alphabet soup of other um, organizations, CTSU, CIRB, et cetera, links to those folks. The SWOG CRA manual is mostly unchanged. It's the same introduction and 16 chapters and five appendices that have um, a lot of good information in them. Uh, we're updating these all the time. And so um, they're a good resource. If you have something that you want to look up, this is a good place to check. And then I wanna talk about the reports page. Right now the patient, I'm sorry, the reports page on the existing CRA workbench, um, there is a little bit of organization to it, but it's just one page. Um, in this new design, we've split out patient reports versus study reports. And so in your patient reports, you're going to have uh, your expectation report, the IPR report, queries, ineligible patients, patients and follow-up. And then there's also a link to DQP um, for your RAVE trials. And then that's separate from your study reports, which will include your studies with no, no, no more required follow-up, 
studies in long-term follow-up, um, SAEs for a study, which can be helpful for IRB renewals. There's a study-specific report for SO820 to identify potential patients. The study-wide and blinding report is used for a small number of studies when that is applicable. We have a variety of accrual reports here. And then finally, lists of BMT and RT facilities. Under patient management, this is specific now for non-RAVE studies, and we deliberately called it non-RAVE, not pre-RAVE, uh, because it includes a registration to the SWAG Latin America initiative. And this is where we would also perhaps place um, information for studies that we opened outside of RAVE for whatever reason. Um, so for your non-RAVE studies, under patient management is where you're going to be able to get to the data submission pieces, um, the Latin America initiative registration. If you have a patient transfer that you need to do for a patient that was registered prior to open, this, you can do it here. Um, planned unblinding is really only applicable for SO931 anymore, but still very relevant. And then finally, a loss to follow-up form, again, for non-RAVE studies. And then finally, uh, there's a training page that includes the CTTC, um, information for your first group meeting, every CRA should know, another link to the SWOG glossary, and then at the end there's finally a contact us page which includes a number of uh, subject specific email addresses that you can use to contact us if you have questions. I should say when you have questions, please contact us. And I believe that might be my last, no, oh that's right, I have a few more things. So in terms of navigation, um, when you click on one of these various sections, there's going to be a space that might have announcements and text that's specific to that section. For example, under resources, where you can find a link to the SWOG policies, we will put um, links to the policies that pertain to patient management in particular, just to make that a little bit easier to find. And then um, if you want to get back to the original list of sections, you would click the... Um, breadcrumbs at the top, the CRA workbench link to go back to the CRA workbench page. And that's very similar to how navigation in swag.org works now. The underlying pages, um, we will, they are going to appear in second windows and we're going to be um, updating these over time. So for now you'll see that they retain their old design and, um, but we were, we're looking forward to um, re, releasing the first phase of the redesign of the CRA workbench with the updated top level pages of all of our sections. And then these underlying things we will get to over time. Okay, that was my last slide. Um, for questions, uh, there's always technical question at crab.org for, you guessed it, technical questions. And then don't forget that contact us list of, uh, a contact us page list of links for subject specific email addresses and other ways to get a hold of us. All right, thank you. I guess we're, and uh, I think we're doing questions at the end, right? Or is that right? Okay, we have a couple of minutes. We have a couple of minutes if there are any questions or if anything came up in the chat. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, we're always grateful when ORP members um, suggest topics for us to present at Open Forum and the specimen tracking system is one of the su suggested topics. Um, so thank you for that. Christine Magner, the Data Operations Supervisor for the SDMC, has gracious, graciously accepted double duty for us, and uh, she's here to give us a brief refresher on the STS. Christine. Graciously. That's funny. Hi, everybody. Uh, now that we have all attended the CTTC yesterday, or you've been doing the job for years, we can all master logging and shipping specimens in the SWOG specimen tracking system. But there must be more to specimen life than that, right? Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm going to go through a few other features of the SWOG specimen tracking system that you may not be aware of in order to make your specimen life more woke. 
I know what you're thinking. First of all, I'm way too old to use the word woke, and I promise I'll never use it again. And second of all, I learned yesterday that actually you might know a little bit about a little bit. So hopefully I can clear up any questions you may have or just kind of reiterate what you already know. What I'll be showing you today through the power of screenshots are some other features of SpecTrack. We noticed that we got a lot of questions about what to do when there were no specimens to submit. Also, as SWOG studies get more sophisticated, the list of potential submissions is ever increasing. There is a way to simplify that. Our team has also worked tirelessly to make the system more user-friendly and fully encompassed to eliminate having to leave the system to make sense of it. Let's start off with the notify that specimen cannot be submitted link. It's important to note that if you see specimen expectations post that you shouldn't be, that you don't think should be there, say there's some cycle two specimens, but your patient never went on to cycle two, please contact the data coordinator to get this cleared up. Now, there are a number of reasons why a specimen cannot be submitted. Noting it in the CRF or RAVE is not sufficient. Noting it in CTSU is not enough. You need to document that a specimen will not be submitted in the SWOG STS. From the homepage, click on the link. As you can see, all three fields are required. You can review previous notifications by clicking the link at the bottom. You cannot edit or modify these, but you can see them and maybe they're fun to look at. Fill in the SWOG patient number, initials, and study number, then click. Depending on the study, the options for specimens can run off of the screen like it does here. There's a way to narrow that down, which we'll cover in a minute. For now, take a look at the middle of the page under the column specimen or material type. You'll notice that some green check marks are there. That means that those specimens have already been logged in by you or someone at your site previously. We'll go ahead and mark the progression, progression specimens as unable to submit. Now, maybe there's only one specimen that you're unable to submit. Uh, I'm just showing you here that it's possible to pick multiple at the same time, which is a real time saver. Select your specimen and then click next step. You'll see here that there's only one required field and that is the reason why the specimen cannot be submitted. I hesitate to give you this freedom, but there's, you can really say whatever you want. And truth be told, we only partially read them sometimes. So fact of the matter is we just need a reason and the requirements are minimal. So you go nutty with it if you want. Um, maybe it was because you were notified of the progression, but the patient never returned to clinic to draw the specimens. It could be a lot of reasons. We just need to know what it is. Enter your reason and click finish. There you have it. The green light at the top of the page tells you that your notification was successfully submitted and is added to your site's list of previous notifications. You can now return to the homepage or return to add a new notification. Note, now that you've done this, any expectations tied to those sub sub submissions have been resolved. It was that easy. Keep in mind, just because you did your due diligence in SpecTrack, this entry may affect eligibility or be a deviation that you'll need to handle internally. So there may, may be more work to do, but as far as notifying SWOG and expectations, it was that easy. And now when you go back to this patient, those progression specimens are now marked with the red X, noting that they were marked as unable to submit. Pretty swanky. Now, let's act like it's the late 50s and get minimalist, shall we? Filters are available in logging a specimen, notifying that specimen cannot be submitted, and in Specimen Manager. Here we see the list of potential specimens for a study. Keep in mind that all specimens need to be listed, although only a small amount might be submitted. This study is pretty light on specimens. There are some studies that would have less than this, but most would have a lot more. So many words. You just have a few minutes to log specimens and you're not trying to read war and peace here. So let's simplify what we're seeing. By using the filters, we control what we're seeing. For multiple step studies, this is especially helpful. You can filter by specimen material type, submission time point, or lab. The study I chose only has one step and specimens are only sent to one lab. So those won't be particularly helpful here, but the other two filters sure will be. Let's select cycle two specimens. By selecting cycle two for submission time point and hitting apply, now we are only seeing specimens that are expected to be submitted at this time point. 
Clicking the reset button will go back to the default of showing all specimens at all time points. The same filters can be used in Specimen Manager. Specimen Manager is a snapshot of all specimens for your institution for all SWOG patients. While Specimen Manager is defaulted to show you all specimens not shipped, this means that they've been logged into the STS but not shipped in the system. With a few clicks, you can see all specimens, whether logged, shipped not received, received and not collected. Ideally, when you go to your Specimen Manager homepage, it should look like this one. Shout out to SCCA, by the way, who I just randomly used. And this, this is like the gold standard. So um, tell your boss, you do a great job. Which means you've done your housework. You didn't abandon any specimens or you got rid of duplicate entries, etc. So we go from this mellow, peaceful screen. But once we click all status to show all shipments, we get pages and pages and pages of entries. For this one, it was over 500. For some sites, it could easily be thousands. This is where the filters really come in handy. Using the same site and starting from the same list, let's narrow down by study. Remember to always hit apply. We went from hundreds to 14. Entering a SWOG patient number is also a great way to filter. You can go from hundreds of specimens to just a handful. The filters work really well. Sometimes I say they work too well, so I urge you to be careful when you're using them. Be sure to reset or clear out your filter info once you're done with it. Hitting apply is required for all modifications. Clicking reset will return you to the default of empty filters and only display not shipped items. Along the same lines, let's look at other time savers. When logging specimens, each is listed out by reg step, time point, specimen material type, and lab. All of these can have filters applied to them. So if you're submitting for a study that has an offshoot lab, you can filter only to show that lab. We've made adjustments to the system to try and make it more user-friendly. We've added a qualifier so that you can easily tell the difference between each specimen, including expected shipping temperature. As a result of unresolved expectations, we've added what material is required versus preferred and alternate specimens. We realize that seeing a lot of options can be overwhelming. So hopefully knowing what is optional and what is required is helpful to you all. We've seen sites go in, obviously frustrated, and mark six, seven, eight different specimens as unable to submit when only one or two were requ required. Having the material requirement column here in gray on your screen should help that. While the protocol lists all of this out, it's now been added in the STS. Now you know if what you're submitting is the only option for submission, like the whole blood tempest tube seen here, or if you have the option of whole blood in the nine mil in the EDTA tube, which is the preferred method, or the whole blood in the nine mil in the cryo tube, which is an alternate. You don't need to submit both. When logging a specimen, you'll see that we've included specific instructions on what label to use and what the labeling should look like. Then as you navigate to shipping the specimen in STS and reviewing the packing list, you'll see again labeling instructions. In addition, there's an expected shipping temperature and reminders for what, if anything, should be packaged along with your specimen. One last thing, some sites are under the impression that expectations are resolved once the site marks it as such with receive date and condition, not true. SWOG would never leave your site at the mercy of another party or lab. Once you log and ship the specimen in STS, the expectation is resolved. If you know that you've submitted something in STS, but the expectation remains outstanding, feel free to look in specimen manager for that patient using the filter, or you can start the process to log a specimen to see the status of specimens for that particular patient. It's possible that you may have selected the wrong specimen. If you're still stumped, reach out to your data coordinator. So now you know there's more to spec track than just logging and shipping. And now we have a room full of experts and sites that can do anything in STS. We are empowered, we are informed, and all of this will come in handy very shortly. Uh, in the meantime, I'm happy to take any questions. I'd also like to remind you that all data coordinators at the SWOG SDMC are well-versed in STS and can help you navigate anytime necessary. I also want to point out there's something missing from this slide that you would never know. When I initially created these slides, the MLB, oh, 
I see my girl out there too. Lockout was going on. So I had a snarky comment about that because I was very fired up. Seattle sports fans have had a rough couple months. So the lockout wasn't helping things. So then the day we finalized the slides, the lockout ended. And then today, fast forward, the day we present, it's opening day across America with America's pastime. So viva la baseball. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And again, we're happy to take any questions. If you could step to the mic, so the at home audience, thanks. Hello. Um, so I do have a question about um, pathology submission. Um, if the preferred specimen to be submitted is 30 unstained slides, and we order those slides from our pathology department, but they send us, say, 15, would it be better to submit half of the preferred, or do you want to, like, go to the alternate, like the block? Ooh, okay. So the end made that a really good question because I had a really simple answer the first time. Depends oh. on the protocol. Um, <laughs> I have found with the protocols I work in that even if they don't have the full amount, the lab will still, if that's the only option, they'll still accept that. And in Spectrec, you can adjust the amount and explain why they're getting half of okay. what they expect. And then just put in the comment section why they're getting 15 as opposed to 30. Yes. Rather than going to the alternate submission. If you have a complete alternate submission and it's complete, I would think that's the best way to go. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm no expert here. And I would just tell you, you know, if you're asking me about one of my studies, I could tell you, but generally speaking, I would contact your data coordinator and find out what's best. But I would say shooting from the hip, a more complete submission would be the option. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. And there's mics in the room and way smarter people in this room than me that are welcome to jump up and contradict that. And there's no questions in the chat, so I think we're good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Christine, but don't go too far. Because <laughs> now we're going to have some fun. Uh, it's time to test your knowledge. And as we change the slide decks, uh, get out your mobiles. And Christine's going to walk us through how to get pull everywhere going for our Q&A. Uh, so while the tech team is pulling up the other presentation, uh, those of you doing remotely, hopefully you attended either the Oishi Symposium or the meeting last night where this feature was used. Even I figured it out and I'm a total tech dummy. So uh, if you can pull out your phones. Um, I know that they gave the option of going to an email address at last night's meeting. Perfect. Don't do that. Stick with the text version. Just waiting for everything to catch up. God, I almost haven't memorized, but anyone that knows me knows how terrible my memory is. So I won't, I will wait for the slide. Perfect. Uh, you are going to text to the number 22333. Don't do it in reverse because I, I tried that. It doesn't work. And then to that number, you're going to text Courtney Will, there is no E and that's intentional, 940. Uh, for those of you that haven't done the Pull Everywhere feature, it's super fun and it's super easy. And uh, at the Oishi earlier today, I, I know that I knew some of the answers and I was all proud and I was totally wrong. So Kara did a lot of trick questions for those that were there. We're not too tricky here, but it should be a lot of fun. Hopefully you've all been able to text Courtney Will 940 to 22333. I'm going to read you a question. You're gonna give me your answer. I don't know who's who, so don't worry about it. Don't be embarrassed, you won't be called out. Um, we'll give you a minute to answer the question, then we'll go through the results. We have a lot of great information here for you, so don't stress about missing one. All right. Ooh. Ooh, that was really fast. All right, so question number one, easiest one of the day. Are you ready to get started?
All right, good. I'm looking, I'm like, wait, it's not all just yes. Cause some people were born ready. My money is on those 11 people. Yes. That is the attitude. I'm always ready for trivia and why not? Um, great. And it looks like nobody missed the information. So I think we are good to go. All right. Ready? All right. Uh, what's important to know is I'm going to read you this clear question, but don't answer until I advance the slide. First question, if my patient is deemed ineligible after registration, the best course of action is to call the SWOG SDMC to cancel the registration, B, remove the patient from protocol, C, treat the patient and submit data per protocol, or D, both answers A and B. Answer away, my folks. Mm, there it is. Perfect. Okay. B's not getting any love at all. And nobody's confident in their answer. All right. Ineligible patient after registration, best course of action is C and D are neck and neck. All right. Hopefully everybody's getting their answers in. This is very exciting. And no word in the chat, which is good. No news is good news. All right. That's a low response rate. Apparently we started off with a tough one. I've got good news for nine people. Well, this is just a, oh boy. Okay. Uh, is it just me back there, fellas? I, I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. I got good news for 10 people. Hopefully 11 if this is right. Yay, the correct answer is C. You treat the patient and submit data per protocol. We have one good answer in the room. You should be proud of that because a lot of people got stumped there. We get a lot of calls letting us know, hey, uh, I registered this patient. Whoopsie. We don't cancel registrations out like that. Uh, as long as there is no uh, danger involved, if a patient is deemed ineligible after registration, the patient should be treated and followed per protocol unless directed by the study chair to remove the patient from treatment. That's pretty rare. Next question, better luck to everybody. With Open Rave and all the tools in CTSU, why, Angela, is the CR work, CRA workbench still relevant? Is it A, it's the only data entry mechanism for pre-rave studies? Is it B, reports include patients on both rave and pre-rave studies? Or is it C, includes critical SWOG specific information such as CRA manual, best practices and policies? D looks good. It's maintained by SWOG SDMC staff like Angela, so tools and resources based largely on CRA feedback and requests. I don't want to give anything away, but that's a really good answer. And then E, all the answers are correct, which is the overwhelming majority here. Look at it go. <laughs> Spoiler alert, Angela is applauding you. All of those answers are correct. Yay. Oh, <laughs> we're not even talking about it. Apparently that's just so much information right there. All of those answers are correct. The CRA workbench is still relevant and it's kind of been told to you in multiple meetings this time. And it looks good by the way, Angela. Thanks for getting rid of the orange. True or false, when entering data on a SWOG study that uses vital status forms, another hot topic this meeting, you should complete the vital status form first using the most recent last date of contact before entering any other data in the chart. It's a lot of words. Some of Kara's slides, it was all like true until the very end. So I appreciate the hesitancy here. And unanimously, overwhelming unanimously, not one person for false. Man, it'd be cool if it was false, but it's not, it's true. Uh, 
Without a doubt, uh, we have covered this thoroughly in the meeting, but yes, always enter your vital status form first before entering any other data. Even if you are reporting previous cycle data, the most recent date of contact should be entered on the vital status form first before completing any study data in order to avoid queries. It's worth noting that you do not need to complete a vital status update for every date of contact just the most recent one when you're submitting any data. That last one's a good one. Not for every data contact, just the most recent. All right, next question. You guys are doing really well, except for the first one. Uh, <laughs> way to rebound. What types of trainings is the compliance learning and SOP solutions class learning management system used for? Is it a, class is used for protocol specific training course, training required for application access, training required for certain job duties, LPO specific trainings, etc. B, class is used for training for registration studies. C, class is used for training for studies with patient reported outcome questionnaires. Or D, class is used for internal CTSU staff training and for training on use of the CTSU regulatory support system database. Please enter your answers now. It's so quiet. You miss that music now, Deb? <laughs> okay, well, it looks like almost everybody thinks it's A, and I have no idea what it is. So this is very exciting for me as well. The answer is... Hey, you guys totally knew it. Nice job. Oh, we don't even talk about it. So here, let me back it up. Uh, that's what it's used for. Class, compliance, learning, and SOP solutions. All right, next question. Who is affected by the identity proofing and multi-factor authentication, the IP and the MFA requirement? Select the best answer. Is it any person with the CTEP IM account? And any system that uses CTEP IM credentials for login access is or will be affected, jumping out to an early lead. B, anyone who logs into the SWOG CRA workbench is affected. C, anyone who logs into the SWOG website is affected. Or D, anyone who logs into the CTSU website at www.ctsu.org is affected. Wow. No love for B, C, or D. Apparently the correct answer is A or we're, we need to start the training over again. Let's check it out. The correct answer is A. Very nice. But I thought these last two questions were like the hardest. Like they were even hard for me to read. So you guys have nailed that. Excellent work. The updated authentication requirement applies to any person with a CTEP IM account and any system using CTEP IM credentials, including all NCI CTEP CTSU systems, including RCR, CTMB AIS, the CTSU website, Open, Rave, Encore, SIS, STEP, CTEP, AIRS, etc. All other systems, including the LPO websites that use CTEP IM for access, and all users, including NCI, LPO, contractor, and site staff. Nice work. Next question. What are CTSU help topics and how do I find them? Well, you can click on the help icon on the right side of most CTSU web pages. You can type any keyword into the search bar at the, o, at the top of the CTSU website and then click on the help topics navigation link on the left side of the results screen. C, you can use all help topics that appear under the resources navigation tab on the CTSU website. Or D, all of these answers are correct. I remember we used to complain that there was like one tiny little like contact us thing at the very, very, like, so look at all these possible options. It's very exciting. Uh, hmm, everybody thinks they're all right. Are they? They are. Very smart crew. I'm glad. And this is coming in a good time. It's like you're paying attention because depending on the meetings you've attended, you've learned that these past couple of days. Excellent work. Help topics are educational resources unique to the screen being viewed. Help topics appear on most CTSU screens and all help topics appear in the resources section, CTSU operations information, user guides, and help topics. All right, we're bound to stump you. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, near and dear to my heart, adverse event assessment dates on AE form should A, 
be the first date the AEs were assessed on that cycle, B, be the date that the first AE was seen, C, be the last day the AEs were assessed in a cycle, or D, be the first day of each cycle. Very intrigued at this one, so we're just going to stare at it for an extra minute. I like it. I like diverse answers. All right, just another couple seconds. Ooh, look at it go. It's a real horse race for second place. I like this a lot. Well, part of me likes it a lot. The other part of me is slowly dying inside at all of these A, B, and D answers. So I'm just going to put you out of your misery and take it away. The correct answer is C. It should be the last day that AEs were assessed in a cycle. AEs should be assessed at the end of every cycle, ideally on day one of the next cycle. That is a query that I write multiple times a day, every single week, every single month. I have it memorized. On a given cycle, adverse events identified from the time of the first treatment on that cycle until the beginning of the following cycle must be reported. The date of the most recent adverse event assessment should be a date equal to or more recent than the date of last treatment on that cycle. All AEs occurring prior to initiation of the next cycle must be reported. Furthermore, when labs are drawn on day one of a cycle and prior to the patient receiving the study drug on that cycle, any abnormal laboratory findings should be reported on the AE form for the prior cycle since they pertain to treatment from the previous cycle. Now, if we get a couple days, uh, we're not going to query you. We give you a little bit of luxury. However, they need to be at the end of the cycle. Again, ideal on day one of the next cycle, but they should be at the end. Next question. Better luck this time. If a required specimen is not available for submission, oh boy, you should know this answer. A, use the notify that specimen cannot be submitted link in the SpecTrack system. B, reach out to the data coordinator to ask them to remove the expectation for that specimen. Thanks for laughing. Do nothing. See, there's no specimen to submit and therefore nothing to enter. Or D, none of these answers are correct. I'll give you a second to answer. I, I'm going to tell you that that answer B, especially me personally, I'm always saying reach out to your data coordinator. We're here for anything. Don't hesitate. Reach out, reach out. I'm the one that's always encouraging that. Except this time. Correct answer is A, use the notify that specimen cannot be submitted link in the SpecTrack system. However, if you're not attending here in person or maybe you kind of missed out on the previous presentation, you can reach out to your data coordinator for assistance. They'll be happy to help you navigate. If a required specimen cannot be submitted, this must be documented in STS along with the reason the specimen cannot be submitted by using the notify that specimen cannot be submitted link. Once you document the specimen is unable to submit an STS, the associated expectation will automatically resolve like we just discussed like 15 minutes ago. So your short-term memories right on track. All right, true or false? SWOG allows rounding of tumor measurements, dosing, and lab values. Man, is that good timing for you. SWOG allows rounding of tumor measurements, dosing, and lab values. I think it's super appropriate that this is split. All right, someone's got to commit and answer. Ooh, ooh, all right. That's close. That's very, very close. The answer is true. True did not get the most votes. So let's learn. When rounding is used in reporting numerical digits on SWOG forms, it must be done to the nearest digit requested on the CRF, whole or decimal, round up for five or higher, and round down for less than five. Uh, BTA and FUDA forms request target lesion measurements be reported in centimeters to the nearest tenth, so 1.5, for example. If the scan report provides a measurement of 2.78 centimeters or 27.8 millimeters, it's acceptable to round the measurement as 2.8 centimeters. It is acceptable. It's not required, if that helps. Rounding is also allowed for any lab or test value related to eligibility unless otherwise noted in the protocol. I will say that if you are rounding, 
um, you're probably going to want to put the actual amount in the comment section of that form so that you're matching up with your source documentation. All right, hopefully we're feeling good about that. That was our first big miss, but a really informative one. True or false? I reported all AEs in RAVE and then submitted the ex Ooh, fast answers. Submitted the expedited reporting evaluation. I thought that one of the AEs should be reported as an SAE per protocol, but the CTEP errors rules engine did not recommend reporting, so no further action is required. Nobody is buying this. Wow. Oh, somebody's buying it. All right. I'm selling. They're buying. I like it. Unfortunately, the answer is false. We did some care magic there. We got a little tricky. The CTEP air system is preloaded with basic rules for reporting. The rules are used to help determine whether AEs require expedited reporting, and it's possible that an AE won't trigger the automated rule, but still requires reporting as an SAE. It's also possible that the rules may recommend an SAE report for all grade four AEs. However, the specific grade four AE is included in the spirit table or protocol specific exceptions for SAE reporting. If the event doesn't meet protocol specific reporting rules, it does not require expedited reporting. For example, in many instances, AEs such as grade four lymphocyte count just decreased would not be considered serious. Guideline is to use the system recommendation as a reminder to check the protocol to ensure that the event does not require reporting. The automated RAVE recommendations for SAE reporting are not always correct. Ooh. If RAVE and or CTAP errors do not recommend an expedited report, but one is needed, sites can override the, recommended, the recommendation by clicking override and CTAP errors or change none to create in RAVE. If in doubt as to whether an SAE report is required for protocol specified criteria, contact the SWAG SAE coordinators for assistance. It's ADR at SWAG.org. They're fantastic. Like you can go through your DC. Again, I always encourage that, but we go straight to ADR. So um, it can be a little confusing sometimes. So don't be afraid to reach out to the experts. All right, true or false? We're reviewing internal accrual records to align with what is being reported from CTEP to NCI CTRP. For studies with multiple reg steps, there is a report accessible from the SWOG CRA workbench that will show which registration step counts towards accrual. I see some furrowed brows, and I am with you, folks. I am with you. We're covering it all here at the open forum. See, it's not just about the basics. All right. If only you could look over Angela's shoulder, I think you would know the answer. <laughs> Poker face, I love it. All right, overwhelmingly finding this to be true. Dun, 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 it's true. I don't see anyone hanging their heads, so we're going to assume that false came online. Participating sites can track accrual credit through the CRA workbench under the reports link under SWOG credited registrations, site-specific patient listing. If selecting show all registration steps, then all credit received is documented with a Y in the reg counts toward accrual column. This report can also be limited to selected registration steps by clicking on the checkbox for show registration steps that count for accrual. After reviewing the accrual credit report, contact member at swag.org, speaking of fabulous DLs, if there are additional questions pertaining to institutional accrual credits. You will also see that these slides all have sources on them, so if you want to look into any of this further after this meeting, you can do it. Slides are going to be available through swag.org. Next question. Ooh, there's a lot of words. All right, how are site payments triggered? A, fit, give me a second to read all this and then we'll flip it for your votes. Federal-based intervention payments are triggered by the enrollment of the patient. B, federally funded biospecimen and other ancillary payment triggers vary per protocol. Review the protocol funding memo for specific notes on payment triggers. These payments are usually triggered by entering the submission dates in the funding tab and open on the CTSU website. 
typical with typically with multiple choice, the longest one is always the right one. But look, we're really going nutty because how do you decide between B, C, and D? C, non-federal funding and additional federal funding, non-NCTN or NCOR payment triggers are listed in the notes section of the funding memorandum for each type of submission or activity. Usual payment triggers include submission of data into Spectrac or submission of a particular activity form. D. The study-specific funding memo lists the payment triggers for each study activity. Participating sites should review the study-specific funding memo posted on the protocol abstract page of the CTSU website prior to locally activating a study or E. All of these are correct. Please vote. Let me tell you something. If the answer is not E, I'm going to be a little upset with whoever wrote this question making me say all those words. All right, well, I, I, I'm happy to see most people going for E, but B was the longest. So using that logic, I'm with you. All right, what's it gonna be? Nobody's going for A, it's the shortest. All right, we got a decent amount of results in, let's do this. Thank goodness it's E, cause that's a lot of words. Uh, federal funding questions, oh, contact Kyle. There's his email address. Non-federal funding questions, contact Debbie. There's her address or Mariella at her address. Thank goodness they're not telling you to reach out to your data coordinator. That'd be a short conversation, let me tell you. All right, moving on. True or false? I'm not able to find the patient reported outcome questionnaires posted on the CTSU protocol abstract page. These should be posted under the protocol related documents section under document type, case report forms. True or false? Man, you people in the chat room, you're just very self-sufficient. Somebody asked a question and somebody gave an answer and everything looks great. So, all right. Um, in the meantime, we have another split vote. I like it. Wait for a couple more. False has taken a commanding lead. All right, well, almost half the crowd's gonna be disappointed in a second. Hey, speaking of being disappointed, really good drinks at Daniel's Broiler on the second floor around here. So if you, you know, you're not doing so well and need to drown your sorrows, woo, they're pretty good drinks there. Uh, the answer is false, by the way. All participant facing documents and forms either given or read to patients, including uh, QOL questionnaires and patient surveys are posted under the CIRB approved documents section of the CTSU protocol abstract page. Due to the NCI single document posting rules, the questionnaires are not included in the protocol related documents section under case report forms. After reviewing the CTSU protocol abstract page, if you're unable to locate protocol or supporting documents, contact protocols at swag.org for assistance. That's a really good tip because I would think to contact CTSU. So there you go. Wow, protocols, you might regret that little note. Okay, uh, next question. Is the treatment calendar based off of the registration date, the first day of treatment, or the most recent treatment date for a dose delay? I'm trying to determine when patient's next MRI needs to be performed to be done within the protocol window. Who do I contact for help? Well, answer A said, it's obviously CTSU help desk since protocol's taken all the other questions. CTSU help desk at CTSU. Uh, contact at westat.com. Oh, they say Westat, my bad. Uh, B, the NCI CRAB help desk. C, the contact email for the data coordinators indicated on the contact page near the onset of the protocol. Or D, email all of the DLs and see who responds fastest. I like that. And I would pull for the data coordinator, but I don't know. All right. This is kind of more than one question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll tell you what. I appreciate the honesty of the handful of people that said D because it certainly happens. <laughs> so thank you for your honesty, but please take note that the answer is C. Only need to email one location. And by the way, look, here are the DLs that I think we've shown in every single meeting I've attended. Uh, I love the DLs. I won't cheer them on for you again in case you already heard my spiel, um, but they are the best way to ensure that you actually get 
not only an answer, but you get it quickly and you get it completely. All right, good job on that one. Treatment schedules and calendars vary per protocol. Calendar logistics, whether assessments, next plan treatment dates are fixed or dependent upon treatment delays due to toxicity or other reasons. Um, they're specified in section seven under assessments, section eight, which is dose modifications, and section nine, which is the study calendar and its footnotes. Follow-up timeframes are usually based off of the date of first progression to the protocol or the date of randomization to treatment. However, this also varies per protocol. Please carefully review the SWOG protocol sections seven, eight, nine, and 14. And again, uh, due to the complexity of SWOG protocols and um, how far they've come, we don't have any flat, we have very few flat answers anymore and it is protocol dependent. So even if one rule applies to one of your studies, you're gonna to wanna to contact your data coordinator and make sure the same rule applies to the other study, even within the same disease site. Okay, true or false, all protocol deviations must be reported to SWOG. Confidence, four people feeling confident, feeling good. I'm gonna let True get a fight in here. All protocol deviations must be reported to SWOG. Ooh, I like it. Uh-huh. This is oddly satisfying watching these bars move up and down. This is so exciting. We should probably work on a color scheme though. Can like one be green and one be blue? Can we do that? No, okay. Maybe turquoise, I don't know. Okay. Uh, people are pretty convinced that that is not true, and they'd be right. Unless the protocol is involved in the deviation reporting pilot program indicated in section 14 of your protocol, only deviations that are resultant from the COVID-19 pandemic and or deviations that affect patient safety must be reported to SWOG. NCI requires that deviations that are resultant from the COVID-19 pandemic are reported via RAVE on the SWOG COVID-19 diagnosis and protocol deviations form. SWOG requires deviations that meet the CIRB's definition of unanticipated or serious noncompliance to be reported to SWOG via email to qamail at swog.org. Questions pertaining to whether or not the deviation should be reported to the IRB of record should be directed to the IRB of record. That's a fun statement. All right, go figure. And again, there's a source there if you need to learn some more information. Um, we do get a lot of calls at the SDMC, like, you know, do I, how do I report this deviation to you guys? Um, this is a very handy reference. It's super false, super false. Uh, true or false? When completing a follow-up tumor assessment form, target lesions that have resolved no longer need to be reported. That's short and sweet. I mean, I, I don't think we're gonna trick anybody here. So uh, sorry to cut your voting off early, but of course the answer is obviously false and none of you are gonna think that's true. All disease present at baseline must be documented to ensure that response can be properly assessed. If a lesion has resolved, you still must report on the CRF that the site was assessed, including the method and date of assessment and measurements if there are any. If measurements were not obtained, the reason for that must be clarified in the comment section of the form. I love a comment section. If zero is entered as a measurement, this must be initially, initially confirmed in the comment section that disease was assessed and then it had completely resolved as opposed to not assessed or assessed but unable to be measured. Again, that's a query that we write often. We love seeing the zeros. I mean, that's great, but we don't know what a zero means. So put in the comment section that it was assessed and completely gone. You don't need to do that every time. Once you've noted that, you know, L1 disease has been completely zero, you don't need to keep noting that. Obviously, if it comes back, then you're going to give that measurement, but we won't question any additional zeros after that for that line. So initially, please do confirm that. Um, also written in the instructions of the FUDA form is that if disease is still present but too small to measure, to enter a 0 0.5. Even though you're following the instructions of the form, when you enter that 0 0.5, you should probably put in the comment section, perform instruction, it was seen but not too small to measure. We always want an explanation of what we're reading. Okay, 
rocking and rolling with these questions. Section five says PET CT is required within 42 days of registration. However, our patient won't be back in clinic until 45 days after the PET. What can we do to register this patient? Select the best answer. I may or may not re need readers. I'm gonna do my best to read this. <laughs> Reschedule the clinic visit in order to conduct all required baseline assessments, the h &P performance status, toxicity assessment, lab assessments within the 42 day and other applicable protocol windows. That's answer A. And it's the longest one. All right, B, register the patient and open on or before day 42 and then conduct the baseline visit with the best practices window of three days, i.e. on day 45. C, request a waiver to register the patient on day 45 since it's just a minor difference in timing. And D, tell the patient that he, she must have another PET CT performed within window to be eligible for the protocol. I'll let you take all that in. All right, looks like we're just down to two. It's either A or C, with the overwhelming leader being A. Let's see how you did. The answer is A. Per NCI policy, SWAG is unable to grant eligibility waivers of any kind. Not only can SWAG not, the SC cannot either. Eligibility criteria specific uh, specified in section five of SWOG protocols, all required baseline eligibility assessments must be performed prior to patient registration to the protocol and within the timeframe specified in SWOG protocol section five. Um, typically insurance isn't gonna cover an additional scan and that's why we're leaning towards A, um, just to get everything rescheduled and have it within that timeframe. However, going back, if you erroneously registered this patient, even though they were ineligible, that's terrible, don't do that. But if you did, the patient could still go on study. You wouldn't have to cancel, just tying in a previous question. All right, true or false? Our IRB requires the investigator's brochure for the SWOG study. I should contact the data coordinators at whatever disease committee at crab.org to obtain the IB. True or false? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm always saying, you know, contact your data coordinator, contact your data coordinator. Apparently there are exceptions, huh? <laughs> We're pointing them all out. I like it too. So the answer here is false. Section three of the protocol will tell you how to proceed with this. Uh, for protocols conducted under CTAP held IND, the current version of the IB for the agent will be accessible to site investigators and research staff through the CTAP pharmaceutical management branch, the PMB, online agent ordering processing, which is OAOP application. We should have had a question about all the acronyms. Man, there's a lot. Access to the OAOP requires the establishment of CTAP identity. Identity and access management, the IAM account, and the maintenance of an active account status and a current password. Questions about IB access may be directed to the PMBIB coordinator via email. And am I the only one with the song OPP in my head right now? Hopefully not. Okay, for protocols conducted under SWOG held INDs, unless otherwise stated in section three of the protocol, SWOG utilizes section three of the protocol as the IB per SWOG policy 15. Most institutions accept the attached policy 15 along with the reference to the statement at the beginning of section three as the IB. In rare cases where the situation, whew, where, where the institution, I'm telling you readers, man, 49 is tough. Institution still requires the IB, SWOG will convey the request to the industry collaborator. The industry collaborator may require the participating site to execute, man, a confidentiality disclosure agreement directly with the company to obtain the IB. Questions about investigator brochures may be directed not to the data coordinator, but to the contact information listed in section three of the protocol or at protocols at swag.org. <gasps> what? That's it? I can make some new questions up. You guys are on a roll. I'm just kidding, and I can't, I can't. Uh, I can't believe that went that fast. Oh. So now to fill the time, I introduce Deb for a song and dance. You guys did really, really great. 
Um, again, if anything is unclear, all the sources are on the slides. You can reach out to your data coordinator and then the highlighted uh, deals that we spoke of. Thank you so much. She is a hoot. <laughs> and she talks really fast. <laughs> Uh, and a very special thank you to Kara also, Kara Labach, for helping us with all of our technology on those questions. That's a huge round of applause for that. <laughs> I don't think we have a whole lot of chat questions. Um, I think that we have answered any that have come in. Does anyone here have any questions on anything that you might have heard? Oishi, open form. We do have some subject matter experts here. Crickets. That is okay. <laughs> I don't have much of a song and dance for you, but I do wanna thank all of our presenters today. They have been wonderful and I do, um, I'm so appreciative of the time and the effort that they've put into it. As a reminder for those attending in person, please complete the evaluation forms and include any suggestions for future open form topics. I did talk to one lady this morning and she would like to see a little bit more regulatory. She was a regulatory coordinator. I would like to see some regulatory in the future. So that is something that we will definitely take to heart and we will do that. Uh, again, save your agendas if you're submitting them or if you're just keeping meeting attendance for SOCRA and, and uh, ACRP. I also wanna give a huge shout out to all those who have been involved behind the scenes to make this a very successful open forum. Our IMS guys, we're very grateful for you. And uh, last but not least, the ORP members, you, for attending both virtually and uh, in person. Thank you very much, and we will see you in the fall.